Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. In this episode, I'm joined by two of the great people I met at the Solana Breakpoint Conference in Amsterdam last month. Amira Valiani, who is head of policy at the Solana Foundation, and Nick Dukov, who is the head of institutional growth at the Solana Foundation. Before my trip to Amsterdam in November, I had not really engaged with the Solana community all that much. However, what I found in the community at Breakpoint was a bunch of smart and engaging people building interesting projects, and I wanted to go deeper, so here we go. In this episode, Amira and Nick both tell their personal stories about their path to the Solana Foundation and the lessons learned they brought with them into the Solana Foundation from their past lives as startup founders. We also riffed on my observations on the diversity of projects being built on the Solana blockchain, from high-volume stablecoin networks to AAA games powered by Unreal Engine 5 like the massive galactic game world that is Star Atlas. Before finishing with a back and forth on what Amira and Nick would like to see Web3 founders focus on. All right here on Money Never Sleeps. I'm just thrilled to be talking to you two again after the fabulous time that I had at Solana Breakpoint back in Amsterdam in November and just wanted to hop on to this session with the two of you to learn a bit more. So just to get started, maybe let's start with Amira. Can you bring us up to speed with your background and how you landed at the Solana Foundation? Of course. It's it's a long road ahead to get here, but you know my career has been basically one part government, one part startups. And that, that's always been true. So I grew up in the Bay Area, my entire family is business people, entrepreneurs. And then I also was involved in political activism in one form or another since I was 14 years old. And so, you know, if you look at sort of where I've come from then till now, it's sort of a combination of those, those sort of sets of interests. So how did I get to the Solana Foundation specifically? Well, before this, I had a company called Glow. We're a creator economy company, basically fintech for creators, specifically focused on podcasters and helping them figure out how to make more money. And so the way I talk about Glow is it's Substack for podcasts. So we sold that business at early 2021 and it was just like spending a bunch of time figuring out what to do next. I had been interested in crypto since 2017. And of course, 2021, everything was going kind of crazy. And I sort of looked into the space and I said, man, this, this seems really different from what I got to know back in 2017. And I said, you know, I have, I have time on my hands. Maybe I should do a crypto week. I wasn't looking for a job. I wasn't looking to start a company in crypto. I just want to be conversant with dinner parties. And so I said, let me do a crypto week. Let me learn as much as I can. Started calling a bunch of friends in the space, you know, joined all the Discord channels. And soon crypto week became, you know, crypto two weeks, became crypto month, became, you know, now it's like crypto two and a half years. So, you know, that that really kicked off the journey into the Solana Foundation. And I, I had a friend who was pretty early in the ecosystem that I was catching up with at that point. And she said, you know, if you're interested in the space, you should come, you should come to Breakpoint. You should come to like the big Solana conference that's happening this fall. And my first reaction was, dude, I'm, I'm not going to Lisbon for a crypto conference. And I talked to my husband about it and he said, why not? And I said, that's probably right. So instantly, as soon as I got to Lisbon and just saw the energy, met a bunch of people building really incredible things a lot of excitement around what was possible in a really positive, high momentum way. I said, I've got to be a part of this ecosystem. So that was, you know, just about two years ago now. That was the first break point. And I've been here ever since. And then, you know, before that, basically, yeah, all startups and government. So started my career off in the Obama administration, left, went to business school and, and was iterating with different startup ideas from there. You mentioned Crypto Week. Do you remember what it was that that even triggered you to think I'll do a Crypto Week? Everyone was talking about it and I had no idea what was going on, right? Like I, I thought I knew what this stuff was because I'd spent a bunch of time in 2017 going deep on it. And then I'd sort of read about this and, you know, I actually think that the thing that really triggered me was I spent a bunch of time in the creator economy and it's really difficult for creators to make money. And I think this is the nut that everyone wants to figure out how to crack, right? How do you take someone who is creating really valuable content and, and just create new business models for them? And I remember reading about NFTs and sort of new business models in blockchain that allowed creators to be able to make more money, better relate to their fans, create stronger bonds. And these were all the things that we were trying to do at Glow, but, but without blockchain involved. And I said, what is this? Like, how does the new Web3 ecosystem help facilitate sort of these better benefits for creators? And I think that's what really made me dig in. I gotcha. It makes sense. And Nick, over to you. 
maybe just bring us up to speed with your background as well and what got you to the point of jumping into the Solana Foundation, yeah? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. So I started my career as a securities lawyer and I was working on financings, M&A and IPOs predominantly for tech companies. And the joke I make is that entrepreneurship looked so easy that I thought I would leave my prestigious high paying law firm job to, you know, go into the wilderness of being a founder. And I did that in 2010. And we were very fortunate that our our company found a market and, and it was ultimately acquired by a public company. And after we sold the company, my founders, my co-founders got very into Bitcoin. And this was circa 2014. And I had not really been paying any attention to it. And they started to get me interested in it. And then the company I was at shortly thereafter, the CTO was very into what was happening with Ethereum. And the Ethereum auction was around that time. And I remember sitting next to him when he was bidding on that buying Ethereum at the Mint. And so I started educating myself about Ethereum. And then another friend of mine, a couple of years later, Dave Balter, who's the founder of Flipside Crypto, started researching all the what were called alt chains at the time. And I just I thought the whole industry was fascinating. I was particularly enthralled by Bitcoin. And it became something that I was doing as a hobbyist while still doing other things. And then I sold my most recent startup in 2021, similar to Amira, and then said, you know what, I got to make this my day job. And I uh, was very fortunate that I got recruited to lead blockchain investments for a venture fund in Boston. And I did that for the past year and a half. And that's when I really became familiar with what was happening at, at Solana. And a mutual friend who was at Solana at the time chatted about this role that they were thinking about creating to build out an institutional vertical. And so we started jamming on that and, and it just, you know, right place, right time. And that was only a few months ago. And he's no longer at the foundation, though. I'm still close with him. But uh, it was a it was a one for one trade. We lost him, but I joined the team and it's been amazing. Folks like Amira and the rest of the group at the foundation is just so committed to the work. And it's it's just thrilling to be here. You mentioned that sometime back in 2017, I think that something about Bitcoin jumped out at you that you just became completely enthralled with. Do you remember what that thing was? I mean, I think it's like the this the sensor resistant nature of it. You know, Ethereum obviously is is extremely decentralized as well, but you know, Bitcoin does one thing and it does that one thing very very well. And it's pretty hard to argue that it's not a durable good at this point. You know, we're ten plus years later, and I don't know what the price is today. I don't really check the prices of these things. You'll go crazy. Hovering that, around forty three thousand right now. <laughs> I mean, hard to argue that you know. It, it's not a lasting technology and infrastructure at this point, I think. I'm with you. All right, great. And then Amira, back to you. I'm thinking about just a description of each of your roles just as as head of policy, Amira, and what that means. So I actually sit on the strategy team. And so I would say my my role is part policy, part related to sort of research and resources for founders, and others for like direct engagement with founders, and then maybe a little bit of work with folks like Nick on things like business development. The policy part in particular really has to do with the fact that policy and regulation is going to play such an important role and already plays such an important role in the development of the space. And so we want to keep an eye on what we can do as the foundation, just be useful as that story evolves. So are there things that we can do to be helpful when it comes to educating policymakers? Are there things that we could do to be useful to educating founders on how to engage with government? So, you know, one of the things that we run, or that we're starting to run is these policy boot camps, actually in collaboration with Polygon Labs, where we get a bunch of people together who are in the space, really curious about how government works and how they can make a difference, and just give them a one-on-one on, on what it actually looks like to engage and be able to help advocate for themselves more fully. And so that's sort of a suite of things that falls within policy, which is really keeping an eye on what is the latest sort of legislative or rulemaking happening out there? And what are things that we can do to help make sure that we are looking out on behalf of the community to be productive members of those conversations? And then, you know, there's a whole range of other things that I'll, I'll work on as well. So for example, the foundation regularly releases reports on the health of the validator network, network performance, the eco state of the network. So how, how the network's sort of climate footprint is, and I'll help produce all of those. And I also do a lot of work engaging with founders directly in terms of helping support them through, I would say, the earliest stages of their journey and figuring out what we can do 
as a foundation to help give a little more juice to founders who are, you know, they probably have an idea, maybe something on the back of the napkin, and they don't know how to go from that to raising their first check or getting their first prototype in the door. So it's it's a really broad ranging role, which I think is fitting with the startup nature of the foundation. You can do a lot of different things from from one seat. Fantastic. And do you cover that globally in terms of policy? I do. You mentioned regulation across I do. different jurisdictions. I do. I do. You know, we're probably mostly focused on the U.S. right now, uh, just because that's where most of the team is. And I think that's where sort of the regulatory landscape, I think, is is not as well defined as it is in sort of a lot of other major economies. But we work sort of with folks globally, especially folks sort of involved in the super teams across the world to keep tabs on what is happening around the world and, and figure out what uh, relevance those have to people building in the ecosystem. Thank you, Amira. And Nick, your role, head of institutional growth. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so head of institutional growth. BCG did some analysis for the World Economic Forum earlier this year, and they predicted by 2030 that $16 trillion of the stock market will be tokenized. And that's actually their conservative forecast. Their upside forecast for that period, which is only six years away, we're, what, 20 days from um, 2024, is that as much as $68 trillion of the market will be tokenized in that period of time. And, you know, I don't know whether it's five years, two years, 10 years, but the train has left the station. And when I talk to leading global financial institutions, you know, they're all investing in the blockchain, both on back office efficiencies, as well as, you know, new products for a world that is increasingly 24, 365, you know, seven days a week. And markets, markets want to be fast, markets want to be efficient, you know, and markets want to be on. And I think blockchain enables all of those things. And Solana is very well suited to become the leading blockchain as the market will be tokenized in that period of time. Fantastic. All right, great. And then Amira, back to you and thinking about the career quick rundown that you gave us. And, you know, like you mentioned, from the U.S. State Department to the White House, Airbnb, I saw that in there as well on your LinkedIn profile, and then exiting Glow and now the Solana Foundation. The diversity of your experience is kind of eye-opening, right? And that you've done a lot across a number of different companies and industries. Would you think that there'd be something, perhaps a lesson learned, perhaps from being a startup founder, but not necessarily, that you brought with you into your policy role now with the Solana Foundation? Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think being a founder and working in different businesses has given me a really deep appreciation for what it means to found a company and the challenges that founders face in particular. And I think these are really difficult to appreciate, not just for people in government, but but people in general who haven't gotten the chance to be a founder themselves and have been employees at other companies. I think the challenges of being a founder are pretty singular and hard to imagine. And so being able to take that lens and talk to policymakers, but then also I do a lot of work directly with founders here at the foundation and be able to sort of understand what they're going through is really, really powerful because it's a really lonely job and it's a hard job and it requires so much clarity all the time. And these are things that I think, you know, when, when you see a company thriving and you see maybe a really great pitch from a founder or you see the business growing and people attaching themselves to it, it feels like success was already faded. But, but really, like, you know, the person who came up with that company or the people who came up with that company, there was so much that was not written yet. There was so much that they had to figure out. Um, and being able to really appreciate that and learn to understand what it's like to be on that side of the table is one of the most powerful lessons that that anyone operating in like the U.S. economy can learn. Yeah, I hear you. And I, I one thing I typically notice as well is that having that experience as a founder, but also having the experience in working for a corporation, right, that in being able to just understand the way that the corporations and enterprises make buying decisions, that that can be incredibly helpful to pass on to startup founders that are within your ecosystems as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think being able to understand sort of the risk reward profile that someone is looking at when they're on sort of the opposite side of a sales call or sales email is pretty important, or just the different demands flowing across their desk is incredibly important. The other thing that I'll say, and I think an appreciation that's even more lacking is honestly having spent time in government and moving into startup world and being able to 
share what that experience is like, I think is really powerful. You know, I think we spend a lot of time culturally just talking about the fact that government's slow. You know, we sort of poo-poo government a lot. It can be really difficult to get things done. It's clunky. And, and it's true. Like government, you know, if you look at Congress, it is slow moving. It's really hard to get a bill through. But if you actually spend time in the shoes of someone who is in one of these jobs, really thinking every day about what they can do to make the country better. And, and I know there's a lot of politicking that goes on and a lot of sort of skepticism around Washington. But, you know, you don't take a job, you know, on the Hill or at the State Department or at the White House and, and sort of work in it, grind yourself away for, you know, a decade, 15 years, whatever it is, without some dedication to the cause, right? These are, these are not glamorous roles. They require a lot of grinding. And, and it's really because people want to make the country a better place, a safer place. And, and do right by people. And I think being able to appreciate that and communicate the considerations that someone who is, you know, reading threat analyses or trying to parse through new technology, being able to communicate those challenges to founders and people operating in this space has been really valuable. I'm, I'm proud that I'm able to do that work. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed that one of our crypto world's biggest supporters in the U.S. government stepped down or will not be running for re-election, Patrick McHenry. So I wonder what he's going to do next, and we'll see what happens there. I just heard that this morning. That's true. You know, it, it is, you know, as, as someone who really understands and advocates for the technology, it is, um, you know, a bummer for, I think, the industry that he's decided to step down or not run for another term. It's also not a surprise. You know, I think a lot of people who've been watching through the space closely sort of knew because Congressman McHenry, he's about to reach his term limit for being chair of the Financial Services Committee. Mm. It makes sense that he's sort of looking around, wondering what his next step is. And, you know, he spent 20 years in Congress. And so, you know, no one can blame him for after, a, you know, a, a really long career where he's accomplished a lot, sort of hanging up the cleats. And there, you know, what's nice is there's a lot of other sort of champions and advocates of the industry in Congress on both sides of the aisle. And so, you know, I'm excited to see a bunch of those people step in and see what they can do to help advance the cause of American leadership in the space. Definitely. Most impressive. He still has his hair after 20 years of doing this since the age of 29. Incredibly so. impressive. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Nick, listen, you've been a two-time startup founder, data analytics and ed tech, ventures with both Northeastern University and then G20, as you mentioned, and now onto the Solana Foundation. What would be for you, one or more, if you'd like, a lesson that you've learned from all those experiences? And again, whether that's from a startup perspective or not that you've brought with you into your role with the Solana Foundation? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and Amira mentioned this in the government context, but I, I think the thing that I take with me everywhere I go is that life is a long game. And to build something valuable and enduring just takes a lot of time. And if you have the luxury, and it is a luxury of, you know, thinking long term when making the big decisions, you know, the bigger bets that you're organization is 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 going to be put to have to make those bets tend to pay off when you approach them with a long-term mindset and you know that doesn't mean that you shouldn't move fast and and be efficient because you have to stay scrappy but if you trade off short-term value capture for long-term value creation you can create stronger flywheels which lead to stronger communities which lead to stronger businesses and i think it's clear to me, even in my short time here at the foundation, that that's how we approach things. And, you know, when others in the space may have, you know, been a bit more loose, shooting a bit more from the hip, maybe taking more of a short-term approach, the Solana Foundation has really had that vision of building something durable. Nick, really curious about if you have other examples about that lesson paying off in your career. I, I mean, I think... It all comes down to relationships. Businesses are just a constellation of human beings. And human beings want to work with other human beings that they trust and that do great work and, you know, are, are building bridges such that others can, can walk on them, they come behind them. And I think from what I've observed in my first person experience as a startup founder, as well as my experience as an investor and founders who've taken this approach when when you when you lay good tracks for others to be able to use them after you and 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 those rails are sturdy and they're clearly built you know with with thoughtfulness and you know that user experience in mind then 
then those rails get used. Um, and I mean, this literally goes all the way back to like the railroads in the United States, but certainly applies to technology and infrastructure in the future as well. And I think why was it front page news the world over this stuff with open AI these last few weeks? Be because it's a human story, right? Like at the end of the day, the technologies we use are built by human beings and people want to know, especially for technologies that are used ubiquitously, like the Solana blockchain, that the people contributing to that have the best in mind for their users. Yeah, I hear you. And I think there's, you know, for me that it it is long term. People ask me, Pete, how how do you keep doing this? And I said, well, it's only been since 2016, so it's not that long. But it's been, you know, all the paths that I went down to try to get a venture fund launch between 2016 to 2021, and it all converged into Techstars and it's worked, right? So everything is cumulative, everything, like you said, Nick, putting the rails down so that others can come with you. I, I could definitely resonate with that, Nick. Just shifting on to Solana specifically, right? I think that just for our audience, it would be helpful to hear the Solana story in a nutshell or two. So, you know, the story starts with Anatoly, who's this engineer who had spent over a decade at Qualcomm building these basically communications networks, right? And what is a what is a cell network? It's basically a distributed network where people communicate. And what is a blockchain? It's it's sort of the same thing, right? So he spent a lot of time thinking about how to create highly efficient, reliable, distributed communication networks. And he was really interested in blockchain. You know, sort of followed the Ethereum story and, you know, had this idea for how to create basically a highly performant version of Ethereum. You know, how do we create basically the fastest, cheapest, most efficient version of what was being created with this idea of a smart contract blockchain. And so the story goes that one night he was like lost in kind of a fever dream, had two coffees and a beer, and sort of laid out the first vision for what this line of blockchain could look like, and then recruited a bunch of his peers from Qualcomm to start building up this idea of a highly, highly performant distributed network that could deliver the same kinds of speeds and efficiency that you might see from something like NASDAQ, but be able to be globally accessible for anyone in the world who had an internet connection. And so, you know, that started in 2017. The network actually launched in March 2020, which you can imagine was a, a really harrowing time to, to get a network out there. And ever since then, I think you see the network and its contributors really strive towards creating a really fast, really cheap, really efficient blockchain. You know, going back to thinking long term, one of the things that really has stuck with me in, in my short time here at Solana is that, and you know, I, I hope it's okay that I share this anecdote, but we maintain a spreadsheet of all the big splashy deals that we intentionally pass on. You know, we at the foundation support the ecosystem, you know, that's a big part of our role. And we're, we're just trying to help founders and other builders in the ecosystem have the tools, resources, et cetera, they need to make the Solana ecosystem, bigger, better, stronger, all that. But one thing we, we don't tend to do is pay to play. And some of our competition, you know, has, has embraced that more. And we maintain a list, it's kind of like vent mm. some venture funds maintain an anti-portfolio, the deals, you know, that they passed on that became unicorn, you know, multi-billion dollar businesses. Similarly, but for another reason, we maintain a list of all the deals that we intentionally pass on because it's clear that folks were paying to play to access those opportunities. And when we look back at that list, we didn't miss anything. Like there was nothing lost by us not paying for those deals because those deals tend to you know, be more short-term thinking. And when you're out there not building and thinking for the long term, like we previously talked about, you end up, you know, not necessarily finding the market. Yeah, yeah, I do it myself. Every single decision I make on the investment side, I keep track of because it's always good to go back and revisit that. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. The investment that I was not involved with a number of years back through a VC that I know well now is you know unicorn level, but I think every investor has a story like that. And you know, with time, it will happen <laughs> that you'll look back and say, well, we should have done that one. But I'd say it's, you know, for me at the earliest, earliest stages, it's all about the team. And it's all about, are these good people? 
are they smart? Are they going to be able to deliver and execute on the and on their vision? And what is their vision? What is the world that they can imagine where what they're doing is incredibly necessary? And they're solving this pain for millions of people or millions of institutions or organizations or small to medium-sized businesses, whatever, right? I think the, the venture business is interesting because you can do a bunch of deals and then go to sleep for five years and wake up to see if you were successful or not. That is kind of the passive investor's view in VC. It's not mine and because I'm quite active, but it's definitely, you know, you can't do this unless it's long-term. You just can't. And, you know, just kind of reflecting on what I experienced, right, when I was at Solana Breakpoint in Amsterdam. Fabulous experience. Nick, you and I got to have a cup of coffee and a bit of breakfast. And Amira and I, you and I shared a cab ride to the, the conference venue. And I ended up being able to see the Star Atlas demo and also meet with Nick, the individual who was responsible or who worked on the... Solana uh, and USDC collaboration with Visa and Nuve. And very coincidentally, like six weeks before that, we had covered both of those stories on this podcast. One where we talked about the Solana, Visa, USDC, Nuve collaboration for testing USDC settlements on Solana. And we also looked at the Star Atlas developers and their game, Sage Labs, or they had built Sage Labs. And I think it was in one weekend that the Solana blockchain did more transactions for the Sage Labs game than what took place on all of Polygon for that weekend. So that was impressive. And that showed to me just the breadth of applications that can be built on top of Solana. And when I was there, I met some fantastic people, probably about, you know, eight to 10 founding teams now that are that I'm talking to in consideration for for tech stars, which is which is fabulous. And others that were a little bit too late. There are even people that I when I got back to Dublin, there were folks that I followed up with and said I had such a great time there. They're like, oh I was there too. I'm like, we missed each other. So people that I had never met in person in this whole time since COVID that were there that we just missed like two ships in the night. But you know what, hopefully we'll be able to go back next year and the year after and get to meet those folks or in other places as well. But, you know, kind of looking under the hood that all of this, that you can see, like I said, that that diversity of Solana-based apps, you know, should we expect more of that or will things eventually go in a specific direction? So I think this goes back to what I was saying where, you know, the foundation's role is is to support the ecosystem because they're the ones building. You know, Amir talked about the founders mindset and 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 as well as enterprises who are who are looking to leverage a a layer one blockchain for a variety of use cases. And Solana is extremely fast, cheap, and secure. And I think that enables all sorts of different utility. And we don't know what people are going to innovate and create. But we want to support that innovation and, and that, that new value creation. And for Solana, I think that means what is only possible on Solana. This is one of our marketing taglines. And it could be in gaming. It could be in infra physical infrastructure. It could be in institutional finance. And we're seeing these really incredible use cases that were not previously possible on the blockchain now possible because of the extremely fast, cheap, and secure nature of Solana's blockchain. I think for Solana, diversity of utility is a strength because we've achieved broad adoption. But if you haven't achieved that broad adoption, then I, I do think, you know, focusing on a niche makes sense. And we're, and we're starting to see, you know, more, more layer one and layer twos, you know, kind of zero in on whatever their specific go-to-market niche is. And that isn't to say that we won't focus on specific verticals, but I think our breadth is a strength. You no, know, we, we might see sort of some of these use cases cluster around certain verticals. A really fast, really cheap, really efficient blockchain has all kinds of use cases. And But I think there's always going to be a pretty diverse breadth of people using the blockchain for use cases that we really could not have predicted. So you know, one of my favorite use cases on the blockchain is Helium. These are basically folks building a distributed 5G network. So a community power 5G network where anyone can go buy a hotspot, 
you know, stick it on their house and help create 5G for, for their community in a way that is much more affordable than they might be able to get through some of the more legacy carriers. And then, so, so there's Helium, right? Which like, if you ask, I think most people in general population about blockchain today, and you tell them like, hey, actually, like there's a really cool blockchain company that's providing 5G uh, that competes with your cell phone network, they would be like, get out of town, right? This stuff is just like, sort of speculative currency. But, but no one really would have predicted that, like in 2017, that that could have been one of the use cases. But then you take Helium, and then you realize there are all these companies building on top of Helium with these really interesting use cases. So like, I met a team that was using Helium's, they also have like sort of a radio network, lower WAN, so these like radio receivers, and they were using that part of Helium network to track lions in the Maasai Mara because it was much more efficient than using sort of existing radio technology. And so you can never really guess what people build. I think what, what we can sort of do is provide the resources and support to the ecosystem to be able to further sort of whatever their vision is and sort of sit back and watch in awe at what happens. Because I think I think we'll see some pretty broad use cases. And, you know, just like if you look back 15 years ago at sort of the uses that people might build on top of the launch of the app store on, you know, the iPhone or mobile phones, and you probably wouldn't have guessed like, hey, a big use case for this is going to be home sharing or ride sharing. I think today, you know, we're, we're just starting to crack the surface of how people might use blockchain. And so I, I think you should expect a lot of really interesting ends to that uh, puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. I can feel it. I mean, the, you know, just to, to go a bit deeper, I mean, the two big things for me, like I said, with the, you know, with Star Atlas, if you're going to be writing transactions onto a blockchain that correspond to game movements, that's a hell of a lot of transactions that you're writing. for And if you're going to be supporting settlements on a credit card network, well, geez, that's, that's a lot of transactions you're going to be sort supporting as well. And on that second point that Lex Sokolin from the FinTech Blueprint, I remember it was right after the news on the USDC and Solana collaboration there that he put out analysis of a few different blockchains and held up the Solana, I think it's 0.4 seconds of the settlement cycle on Solana compared to, you know, what is it? 13 seconds or one minute or 10 minutes on other blockchains. And that was impressive. And to see Solana operating at scale and being able to do that with these two completely diverse use cases, just what really impressed me. And then since then, meeting folks working on digital ID, and we know the digital ID that living on Solana, you're going to have an awful lot of hits that come from that and incredible amounts of privacy and security that are based around that as well. So listen, I'm, I'm going to keep going, you know, and this is a, it's a good story. I'm going to keep pursuing it. And I, I, like I said to you both before, I hadn't been that involved in the Solana community in the past. And just thank you for, for bringing me into it. Really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited. I'm so excited that we're both on and get the chance to be on Money Never Sleeps. I'm so excited that you can break point. So, you know, appreciate, appreciate your digging in and seeing what, what this chain can offer. Definitely, definitely. Thinking about the founders more broadly that you've both come across, I'd say in the last year or so, or maybe two years. And is there anything that you'd like to see them do more of or less of in Web3 and building their projects or building their businesses? Yeah, I'd like to see more B2B blockchain use cases targeted to Web2 problems. I think a lot of founders build for the problems they've personally experienced. And so in the past few years, we saw a lot of crypto startups for crypto startups. And that was good because the tooling at the time, you know, was less mature and now it's gotten a lot better. But at, at this stage, I think the tooling is robust enough that the next phase should be to build the applications that replace and improve upon Web2 technologies. And we saw this happen in Web2, you know, early Web2 companies like Twilio, SendGrid and others helped make it so much easier to start and build startups, you know, this is the whole kind of picks and shovels thing. And then what happened is Web2 matured and companies went up market building for the enterprise. And that was where a lot of the big value creation ended up being. Think companies like Datadog and Snowflake. And I think that that's the next phase for the blockchain, which is institutional growth. Yeah, I hear you. And as I've been reviewing all these Techstars application, the thing that is standing out to me is just what you said there, Nick, is the web two applications of blockchain, okay? 
a couple of years ago, when I saw all these applications coming in, it was dismissed, 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 dismissed for a number of different reasons, including the, some of the preferences of the partner we were working with at the time. But now, even if we had been able to do those deals back then, it would have been, I think, too early. What's happened over the last two years is because the blockchain space tends to move in dog years, right? That every year is seven years of development in the Web2 world because it's, it's still relatively small and, and we can move that fast. That what I'm seeing now for the applications of people applying blockchain to Web2 problems just seems really exciting. And that one of the, the, the third part of our tagline for Techstars Web3 is that investing in those founders helping to onboard the first 1 billion users of Web3, whether they know it or not. Now, I didn't put that last bit in writing, but that's, those are the brackets that sometimes end up in there. And that just seeing people that have decided, well, in order to get my value proposition to market in a way that will be the most frictionless and enjoyable for users is to base my tech stack on blockchain. And it just so happens that they choose to build it on Solana or, or another blockchain. And now that I'm seeing those propositions, again, things just seem so much more mature now. And I know that sounds crazy to sometimes hear in the nascency of what we're all going through in this space, but I, I'm kind of feeling it now uh, and seeing some new propositions around what's being referred to as DPIN or decentralized physical infrastructure is entered the lexicon in the last few months for me that I feel like we're on the verge of blockchain becoming as utility and commonplace as, you know, you mentioned Nick 12, 15 years ago when, wow, cloud technology is some new fantastic thing, but we've got to be careful of it, right? And that I think that, you know, that's where we're going to end up with blockchain, but we still have the need for all of these founders to execute and to deliver and get their get their products to market, you know? So I just wanted to let you know that, that yes, I think we are seeing some similar things in terms of solving Web2 problems with blockchain. And I would like to see more of it as well myself. Amira, for you, anything that you would like to see founders do more of or less of in Web3? Yeah, I was just I was just thinking through what you were saying and I, I completely agree with you, Nick. And I think the way that I might think about it is zooming out and really asking founders who are in the space to focus much more on the problem they're solving than the blockchain part of things, right? There's so many problems out there to solve that we've theoretically heard about blockchain being useful for. You know, we talk about remittances, for example. There's so many different ways you could tackle the remittances market or the payroll market or climate. You know, there's so many different approaches to be able to tackle that. And I think often what you see is founders in the space get really excited about putting crypto first or blockchain first rather than the problem first. And so I think what's really critical is if you're building on blockchain, not to start with what chain are you using or what does the technology look like, just to start with what is the problem and why is blockchain even useful here? Because I think if we keep working backwards with saying we need to start with blockchain and then find a problem as opposed to saying, we need to start with a problem that is sort of in this suite of areas that might be crypto related and then figure out if there's actually a reason that blockchain might be able to deal with it in a way that is different, better than what you see with existing infrastructure. I think we'll just see a lot more companies thriving and delivering real value to users and get the space to the first billion folks using it, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. You just triggered something for me. But listen, kind of rounding this out, that... The way that we end this podcast on almost all episodes that we do is to ask this one final question, which is, what is one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about you? And Amira, we'll start with you. I saw this question. I wasn't quite sure how to answer it. The first thing that came to mind is I'm a huge tree hugger. Like I love spending time in nature. I'm outside all the time. I'm cool. a scuba diver. I did this big 10-day, 100-mile trek around the Alps this summer. Wow. 10-day, 100 miles? Yeah, it's called Tour de Mont Blanc. It's it treks through Switzerland, France, and Italy. It is it is really spectacular. It's, it's sort of well traveled. And did you have to do a lot of training for that to be able to for for that type of mountain trekking? Yeah, we probably should have done more. I mean, really, what it is is it's just like a really intense quads and hamstrings workout because mm. you're spending the first 
half of the day basically climbing up 3,000 feet of elevation and then the second half of the day going down that 3,000 feet. You just do that every day. So by the end, it's, it's, a, it's a real workout, but it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah, we, I've got the foothills of the Dublin Mountains just behind me here, but it's only 600 meters up to the top. So it's not a, it's not a huge lift, still, but it's still something still decent. fun yeah, to do. That's fun. Yeah, we're going to do our little walk up there on, on Christmas Eve with the kids coming up because there's a lovely pub on the way down called the Blue Light. So That sounds like a blast. Nick, same question to you. What is one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about you? So last summer, I had the good fortune to teach entrepreneurship at a university in Italy. And I feel most at home in Rome. I love the culture, the food, the wine, the pace of life, the architecture, everything. I'm a native Texan, but I think I was a Roman in a past life and not an ancient <laughs> Roman because I know there's like a whole meme, you know, when was the last time, you know, you, th you know, men th thought of it in ancient Rome, but I, I mean, a modern cosmopolitan Roman. Okay. And, uh, I just, every day I could, I could, I could do that, you know, wake up, have a great um, espresso, pastry, the buzz of the city, the warmth. Amazing. Well, like Rome, blockchain wasn't built in a day, right? So we got a great way to wrap it. <laughs> you crushed that one, Pete. Awesome. Well, thank you, folks. Listen, it was great to chat with you both. I really enjoyed this. And I'm really looking forward to seeing more incredible things come from the Solana community. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us. That does it for this week, folks. Thanks to Amira and Nick for all the insights they shared in this episode. You can learn more about Amira Valiani, Nick Dukoff, Solana, and the Solana Foundation on our website, moneyneversleeps.ie. We'll do a deeper dive into the output of this conversation in our Money Never Sleeps newsletter on Substack. So check that out on moneyneversleeps.substack.com and subscribe. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify as it helps others to find the show. Also, thanks to Kona Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode. Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm an early stage startup investor focused on where fintech meets crypto and crypto meets Web3, and I lead the Techstars Web3 Accelerator. There are plenty of links in the show notes on moneyneversleeps.ie and how to get in touch, so don't hesitate to reach out. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya! See ya!